Good morning and welcome to St. Matthew Lutheran Church and our service on YouTube. So this morning, Sunday morning, is probably pretty cool outside and you can think about those folks that are out in their car and maybe a few that end up in lawn chairs all bundled up as we have our service both at uh, 8 o'clock and 10.15 this morning. But this morning we're having a third service. We're having a service at um, 12 o'clock. So if you really feel motivated and you're able to come out, you can come out in your car at 12 o'clock and see the confirmation service. We're going to be confirming um, 10 children this morning. And so we'd like to keep them in prayer as well as they start their uh, confirmation of their baptism. And we look forward to that service. Um, we're also able to have all of our classes that we're doing on Zoom. So if you want to take part in our 915 worship, I mean our Bible study for life together, you can do that on Zoom. You'll be receiving that link. Also, our other classes, both for high school and middle school, um, are on Zoom as well as, as confirmation is. Um, We'll be starting our Connect classes next Sunday as well, if you want to be part of that and learn more about um, the faith and about being a member of St. Matthew Lutheran Church. And then starting in October, we'll start our early communion classes also. Let's begin our service. We make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Do not hide your face from me. Do, Do not, not turn, turn your, your servant, servant away in, in anger. anger. O oh, you who have been my help. Do, Do not cast me off. Do not, Do not forsake me, O oh God of my salvation. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. I, I a poor, poor sinner, stand, stand before, before God, God, repenting of all of my sins. sins. I have misused my Lord's name. name and my worship and prayers have faltered. My focus has been self-centered rather than God-centered. My love for others has failed. There are those whom I have hurt and those whom I have failed to keep help. My thoughts and actions have been self-serving rather than servant-minded. Is this your sincere confession? I am sorry for all my sins. And I ask for God's mercy and grace. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you. And for his sake forgives you all of your sins. Your sins have been paid for by Christ. They are forgiven. Amen. May he who begun this good work in you bring it to completion. At the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you.
In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. Power and riches and wisdom Let us pray. O blessed Lord, give us grace to rely on Christ and his redeeming work on the cross. As we delight in his grace, may we humbly receive and share your generosity and kindness with others. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We hear now from the word of the Lord from Isaiah, the 55th chapter. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading comes from Philippians, the first chapter. I want you, brothers and sisters, to know that what has happened to me has helped to spread the good news. 
All the palace guards and everyone else knows that I am in prison because I am a believer in Christ. Because I am in prison, most of the believers have become more bold in Christ and are not afraid to speak the word of God. Because you are praying for me and the spirit of Jesus Christ is helping me, I know this trouble will bring my freedom. I expect and hope that I will not fail Christ in anything, but that I will have courage now, as always, to show the greatness of Christ in my life here on earth, while whether I live or die. To me, the only important thing about living is Christ, and dying would be profit for me. If I could continue living in my body, I will be able to work for the Lord. I do not know what to choose, living or dying. It is hard to choose between the two. I want to live this life and be with Christ, which is much better. But you need me here in my body. Since I am sure of this, I know I will stay with you to help you grow and have joy in your faith. This will give you reason to give more thanks to Christ Jesus when I come to visit you again. Above all else, you must live in a way that brings honor to the good news of Christ. Then, whether I come and visit you or am away from you, I will hear that you are standing strong with one purpose, that your work, that you work together as one for the faith of the good news, and that you are not afraid of those who are against you. All of this is proof that your enemies will be destroyed, but that you will be saved by God. God gave you honor not only of believing in Christ, but also of suffering for him, both of which bring glory to Christ. When I was with you, you saw the struggles I had, and you heard about the struggles I am having now. You yourselves are having the same kind of struggles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel, according to Matthew, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. And he told them, you also go and work in the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. And so they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and still found others standing around. And he asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them. I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the gospel of the Lord.
got great news. We've hired another person here at St. Matthew to work part-time. It's Andrew McDonald, and he's interested in possibly being a pastor someday. But as a newbie, he's got many tough questions. And so we've got this 10-week scenario going on with tough questions. And so who better to ask those questions than the new guy on the block to the people that maybe maybe know a little bit more. And since Pastor Paul's going to be the first one up, we're going to give him maybe the toughest question first. Well, hello, Andrew. It's great having you on the ministry team. Thank you so much. It's really great to be here. I hear that you might have some questions for us this morning. I sure do. I hear that they might be some difficult questions. You might say that uh, the idea is to be better, to be a more effective witness for Christ. Well, I think that is an excellent idea. And uh, I guess I have to ask, do you have any questions for me today? I do indeed. Um, do you want to take a crack at it? I, uh, well, sure. Why not? And, uh, you know, I think uh, Pastor Blaze was being way too modest. Uh, why not just make a little suggestion? That why don't we save the really tough questions for Pastor Blaze and Vicar Dave? I think they'd really enjoy the challenge. Sounds good to me. I think I can do that. Okay. Fire away. What would your question be for me today? Well, I thought we'd start off with this one. Uh, does God really care about us? This is the easy question, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, do you want me to give you another one? or? Uh, no, 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 no. That's fine. I think um, I'll try to do that. Uh, see what we can do. Okay. Uh, I have complete and total confidence in you. I'm glad somebody does. I'll give it a try. Okay. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be and remain with you all. Amen. Would you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. My dear friends in Christ, 
when I consider some of the questions that one might be asked, it does also kind of occur to me that one has to kind of think, why would a question be difficult? Sometimes it's a matter of one's perspective. And a question like we have just received about, does God really care? I think you really have to think too, where is our focus being placed? Understandably, we often have our focus on a very imperfect world in which we live. But what if we take a step back and take a broad look at the nature of God's creation? There's no question we live in a fallen, very imperfect world. As Shakespeare memorably said, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And so I have to think, what about this stage? And the whole thing suggests to me that there's a stage manager behind all of this. When you consider the entirety of the universe and of the earth, I begin to sense something. You know, we're just a few days away from the end of summer. And less than 48 hours from the Sunday morning, we're going to have what's called the vernal equinox. And we mark a spot between solstice and solstice on this orbit of our earth in which we see a certain rhythm that never fails over and over again. You can set your watch by it. In fact, we do. This earth, from solstice to solstice, year to year, twirls around in its spinning and it goes about its orbit around the sun and spinning itself and seesaws back and forth in absolute precision. It doesn't fail. It preserves a habitat, if you will, for the human race, a very imperfect human race that is amazingly precise. And it provides for an earth that is life-sustaining as every bit now as it was millennia ago. David, a thousand years before Christ, the time of the apostles and the early church, which was, again, 2,000 years ago. Martin Luther, 500 years ago, or we ourselves at the beginning of the 21st century. We all need the same allotment of oxygen, and we've always gotten it millennia after millennia, year after year, generation after generation, and it's never failed. If it had ever failed for a fraction of a second, life would cease. So I have to think, why is this breath of life being continued so specifically in this cocoon we call Earth? And why would God seem to have some sort of passing interest in preserving these earthlings. But it doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop there. Voice after voice, word after word, prophecy after prophecy, event after event, through a specific group of people in place and a span of time, revealed something pretty remarkable. And it's very different from all of the other cacophony of the human race. There's an accuracy that is breathtaking. Even though these men and women may have been centuries apart in the ancient Middle East, what they said and what happened subsequently matched perfectly every time in every way. Even though they could not know they could not have understood entirely what they themselves so faithfully transmitted. And so, as I think about that communication, that there is a voice that is 
speaking and a hand that's at work that is in those people and working through those people but working way beyond those people. The main communication that they provide is precise signs by which one might recognize a revelation that he is at work in a special way on this earth in the midst of humanity, ultimately pointing to one Jesus Christ. And he, with an unworldly love and an unworldly power, was able to endure this earthly life in a way none of the rest of us could and endure a death that people still struggle to comprehend. This gloriously marvelous good man dying this ignominious death on a cross and to the very end speaking in grace and in power and in mercy in full control all the way to that breath when he breathed his last. And I have to say, as I think about that, that those signs that point to that are extraordinary. You can find out the entire detailed suffering that Jesus is going through on that cross as you read the 22nd Psalm. But it was written 1,000 years before it happened. I can open up my Bible, my Hebrew Bible, and I can read from that Masoretic text that Moses had placed a bronze serpent on a pole. And to the Israelites in the wilderness who had been bitten by snakes, by serpents, and were dying of the venom in their system to just look at that, they would be saved and healed. 1,300 years before Jesus says that he himself will be on this pole, this cross, by which then raised up he will draw all men, all people, to himself. All those centuries later. And who else could it be when Isaiah, 800 years before the birth of Christ, speaks of the love of God in a description that goes like this. Behold, I have engraved my people on the palms of my hands. Jerusalem, your walls are ever before me. Eight centuries before the palms of Jesus were pierced by the nails on Mount Calvary as he faced those walls outside of Jerusalem. I've looked at many religions in my time. One that I looked at recently as I was studying and thinking about different things is the Taoist approach. You know, Tao really, I understand, means road or a way or a path, but by very definition, it's said that there's a certain ruthlessness about this path to heaven and saying that no leaf is spared of its beauty, no fragrance is spared of the flower. In other words, all are on that path and with the ruthless truth, it disappears. To my Muslim friends, I'm told that the idea is to please God by doing certain things and that at death that the two questions will be asked by angels and if asked and answered properly, the sleep of death will proceed and then the last judgment will come at which time you'll be judged on what you have said and done and so on. But it's still all on oneself. Many I've known have been in Buddhism. But there, heaven, or more accurately, heavens, is an illusionary reality, according to that. And so one presses on in the idea of reincarnation with one's own efforts to really actually escape the cycle of rebirth. It's all on oneself. 
or Hindus among my own cousins. And I talk and I find how similarly with reincarnation idea, it's one's own effort putting forward that in one's own life that will ensure the better rebirth in the cycle. But then I read my scriptures and I think about my Lord and I receive a communication in that word that is entirely different. There is judgment there too. But Jesus says, I'm going to meet you there. In fact, I'm going to come earlier and I'm going to take care of it for you. I am going to bridge that chasm that exists between you and God, between death and life. And the words he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes should not perish but have everlasting life. It's all on him. And he adds, for, the, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. It's materially different. All of this orchestrated by an amazing God out of eternity, throughout the universe, throughout time, with precision, laser-like attention to show that he cares and wants to show that he cares. But maybe I better pause there for a moment and check with Brother Andrew and see if I'm anywhere near the right track on that question. Um, well, okay. Is it making any sense so far, some of the things I shared? I I mean, I don't know. Well, that's okay. If not, if you're, you sound a little hesitant there. I mean, it, it's fine, but... But I sense another question coming. I mean, well... How does God care about us? How do you know that God cares about you? Somehow I had a feeling that question was coming. Let me share all I can share about myself. Okay, thank you. Yes. It really is a personal response for all of us. First of all, God is amazing that loving, caring God throughout history as I described, and then very specifically how he delivers that to his people in communion, in that wonderful celebration of our Lord's body and blood. It's given to the whole church, and yet you and I receive it individually as we receive the true body and blood of Christ, body and blood, soul and divinity for you. That baptism offered for the redemption of the world, but delivered to you and to me in a specific time and place and delivered from him personally to each of us personally. And even in confession, he saved the whole world, but in that confession of one's sins and receiving that absolution, it's delivered personally to you and to me. But I would even... Maybe share a word beyond that, too. How the Lord makes sure that we understand that the way of Christ is very much evidence of his action and his presence and how personal it is. I know my life would be impossible to explain otherwise. When I think of all the ups and downs and the strange things that have happened and repeatedly how I have been reminded that the rug can be pulled out from under me very quickly, and I've lost so much of what in human life we consider valuable, and yet God was always there. And he always provides an escape or renewal and joy, even in the midst of fear and sorrow. Maybe I'll give one example. As one connects one's life in Christ, the prayer and the conversation with God and how he can respond. I 
was thinking back to a situation, there are so many, but one that comes to my mind is a time in my life when I was at a particularly low point. And I have to probably preface by describing uh, how important it was to me how my grandparents were so special to me. I, I was very close to my grandparents and my grandmother, my maternal grandmother especially, was very close to me and I was very close to her and I had thought about that a number of times and at this particular low point in my life, in my prayers, I was thinking how much I missed them and I closed the prayer in a way that I don't normally say but I closed the prayer saying to the Lord, Lord, tell my grandparents how much I love them and how much I miss them as they have been with him now for many years. I should say also that my grandmother was a woman of amazing talent musically. Music was very important to her. And she played any number of instruments. She had a beautiful voice. She taught music. She had choirs. In her younger years, she played music for the revivals and tent meetings. She was a woman of great faith. And as a part of that, she had a song that was a song that really was something of a trademark. It was called Heavenly Sunshine. It went like this. Heavenly sunshine, heavenly sunshine, flooding my soul with glory divine. Heavenly sunshine, heavenly sunshine, hallelujah, Jesus is mine. It's an adaptation of a song that's a gospel hymn called Heavenly Sunlight. It was more than just a song, a favorite song. It was something of a trademark as she used it with her choirs and she used it with children's ministry and so forth. And I can remember in my mind scenes when we would arrive as a family in our car driving to the edge of the, their home and the lawn and we kids getting out of the car and all the cousins and so on crossing that yard. And instead of ringing a doorbell or knocking at the door, we'd start singing that. And I could see my grandmother and grandfather appearing at the door, coming out on the porch, and my grandmother sort of directing us as we sang along, and she joining in and giving us all those grandmotherly hugs and kisses, singing that song all the while. Well, not long after uh, I had that prayer, in fact, a day or two later, I received a letter from a very dear friend. And in it, there was an enclosure, a piece of paper folded up, and the friend had written in the letter saying, well, that she had run across this particular poem and wanted to share it with me and hoped it was a word of encouragement. And I unfolded the enclosure and I looked at it and read it. Heavenly sunshine, heavenly sunshine, flooding my soul with glory divine. The world would say that's a coincidence. But I'm with St. Edith Stein, who famously said, there is no such thing as coincidence, and there are no coincidences. Do you understand when I say that to have an experience like that and others like it, I would be a fool to take it any other way than what is sometimes referred to as a God wink? Those experiences that may seem almost trivial to anyone else, but to oneself in connecting it with prayer and one's own experience looms large and very personal and very clear. As our Lord makes sure that as in a moment like that, I was being reaffirmed about the resurrection itself, the joy of our faith, and that he cares about us more than words can say. Heavenly sunshine, heavenly sunshine, flooding our souls with glory divine. He cares for you. Amen.
And now may the peace of God that passes all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended in hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From hence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, gracious and loving Lord, we praise and thank you for all that you have done for us, the way that you have provided for us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the way that you have provided for us through your Holy Spirit, the way that you have provided for us and all that we have in this life, for our lives, the way that you personally are intervening in our lives and holding us in your hands. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you would look down upon all those throughout the world, that they may know of your presence in the world, your presence in their lives. Dear Heavenly Father, that they may know of the joy and the peace that comes through you, the love that you have provided through Jesus. Heavenly Father, we ask that you look down upon all the world leaders, and that you give them wisdom in their decisions, that they honor you and care for those that are in their charge. Heavenly Father, we ask that you look down upon all those that struggle to find you, that they may find you or that you may appear in their lives. Lord, we ask that you would look down upon all those that are suffering, particularly from the wildfires throughout our country, that they may know that you are working in their lives, that you may use all of the effects of these fires to your glory. We ask that they we quickly put out, that you keep those that are fighting them safe, dear Lord. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would look down upon all those that are hurting from COVID-19, that are suffering from its effects, that have lost loved ones because of it that you would bring peace and wholeness to their lives. Dear Lord, we ask that you would look down upon all those that are suffering, those that we name in our hearts. Heavenly Father, we ask that you have them know of your presence in their lives and that you touch them personally. Lord, we ask that you look down upon all those that are hurting financially, and spiritually, all those that have fallen into depression and that you would give them peace and comfort and raise them up, dear Lord. Heavenly Father, use us as your hands and your tools. Use us to hear the cries of those that are in need, to help those that are hurting. Lord, we look forward to that time when we will be in your presence in your heavenly kingdom. We ask all of this in your name. Amen. We continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and beneficial that we give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. In your goodness you daily and richly supply for all of our needs. Grant us salvation through your Son. Give us faith to trust in his unfailing love and grace to live humbly, upright, and peaceful lives in his name. Therefore, together with angels and archangels, with all who rejoice in the courts of heaven, we praise your glorious name by saying...
Holy Lord, mighty God, in your mercy you remain faithful to your children when they re reject your word and sought their own way. You did not abandon them to death, but established hope for the days when your son would redeem and restore your people by his obedient life and life-giving death, giving thanks for all that Jesus has accomplished and trusting in his word and promise we come in his name to receive his body and blood in the bread and wine. Guided by the Holy Spirit, renew our hearts and minds to live out our faith in ways that are pleasing to you. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he said, This cup is the new covenant given for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. 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 Come, Come, Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. We give you thanks and praise, Heavenly Father, for the salvation and the freedom accomplished for us by your Son upon the cross. Guard our new lives, born of water and the Spirit, and guide us so that we honor you with our words and actions. Free us from the envy and teach us to rejoice in your all-sufficient grace. Lord, lead us into your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. May this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ keep you steadfast in the true faith for life eternal. Amen. We pray. O oh God, you sustain our hearts in mercy, grace, and favor. Guide us as we continue to hear and believe your word. Ever grateful that we are yours. May we faithfully share your word and love with those in need of your grace and truth. Sustain us through temptation and deliver us from harm that we may continue in faith until the day when Christ returns and we are reunited with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Pastor Paul, next steps. Well, I think among many things that we are 
struggle with is that, as the phrase goes, the world is too much with us. So often our focus is on this imperfect fallen world and our own problems and imperfections in it. But God invites us to live a life, a new life in him above all of that and shows us his power, his grace that is far above it and in control of all things. So my challenge, I think, to all of us is to concentrate more on him this week and in very specific ways focus on his work around us as we look for it and we'll see it. As we look at his holy word and see him there and speaking to us in the scripture and in prayer and in very specific prayer for he wants to meet us in conversation in prayer. Very good. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.